Welcome troops. We will start with Newton's first law and some equilibrium. We'll solve an equilibrium problem. We'll even get into Newton's second law of motion as well. You will need to write down Newton's first law of motion because it's super, super important. And here it is. If you want to pause it, write it down. Maybe you've already got it written down. And this is a fine way of defining it for the IB. But you should also remember it simply as the law of inertia. Uh, and sort of the saying that you may hear a lot of people saying is this here about how things in motion tend to stay in motion and things at rest will tend to stay at rest. Now, the first part here, this tend to make sense. This made sense to everyone uh, at Isaac Newton's time in the early 1700s, but this last part didn't make sense to them. It actually doesn't make sense to a lot of people these days because you know that if you slide something across the floor, let's say you throw your book and it slides across the hallway, it doesn't stay in motion. It comes to a stop. Uh, but that is because you've got the force of friction acting on it. And it's also somewhat counterintuitive because you would think that extra inertia or extra mass would mean that it would tend to stay in motion better. But sometimes we know that if we throw a heavy object, it slides to a stop even faster or even earlier because there's extra friction on it. But you can pretend that if there is no friction on anything, and you throw it across a frictionless hallway, it will go and go and go and go and go and go forever and ever. So let's take the example of, let's say that I've got a beach ball here, and clearly this is a bowling ball here. If you have them on a nearly frictionless surface, like let's say a bowling alley, if you go up and you kick the beach ball, then it's going to go into motion quite easily because it has low inertia. And it is easy to make it not be in a state of rest. The bowling ball, which you know has high mass or high inertia, you try and kick it and put it into motion, you're going to break your foot. Same thing with when it's in motion. The beach ball, when rolling down the bowling alley, very easily stopped. It bounced off a pin. The bowling, alley, the bowling ball would cruise right through the pins, knock them everywhere, because it has high inertia. And what you want to remember is that inertia and mass are the same thing. The units for inertia are kilograms. And you can also remember this fact here. Translational equilibrium is actually not too complicated. It's when you have this sigma f equals zero equation, which means all your forces equal up to zero, or you could also think all of your forces balance. This becomes pretty key for solving some free body diagram problems, which we'll try right now. Let's have you try an equilibrium problem, and I will help you out. You've got this uh, six kilogram block sliding down at a constant speed, and I'm asking you to find the normal force and the friction on the block. Pause it, give it a, a think. As a hint, whenever you're dealing with ramps or inclines in the world of physics, it is nice to put in a second set of axes. This one is corresponding to the down the ramp, and then this one is perpendicular to that. Now give it a pause and see if you can draw your forces. Hopefully your free body diagram looks half as awesome as mine does, and that you've got weight, friction, and normal force, and your normal force is going perpendicular to the slope of your ramp. Now that ramp is 35 degrees, so all of these angles are going to be 35 degrees as well. Now you can fill in that since it's a 6 kilogram block, we're going to have a 60 newton force here. Now the interesting thing is that we only have one force on our y and x axis, the traditional ones, and then these are at funny angles, which is bad. But what you can do, x and y are not defined by the constraints of society that is horizontal and vertical. We are so crazy that we are going to make down the slope x. Holy cow, that's crazy. And then y 
is going to be perpendicular to the slope. And that puts the normal and friction right on the axes, and that makes things great. So now what you need to do is you only need to break one force in your components. You need to find this component of weight that we're going to call mg sub y, and this component of weight that we're going to call mg sub x. And so using a little bit of trig, mg sub x is going to be the smaller one. That's going to be 60 sine of 35 degrees. And that turns out to be 34 newtons. And you can say that mg sub y is going to be 60 cosine 35 degrees. That's going to equal the larger 49 newtons. And now, if we know that the sum of the forces in the y direction all equal 0, we know that the vertical, the positive y's, must equal the negative y's, and we only have the normal force minus mg sub y that is equal to 0. Or in other words, n equals mg sub y. So the normal force must equal the 49 newtons. Hey, hey, how about that? Now, for friction, it's just as easy. Because there's no acceleration, constant speed. Oh, this point 0.3, that was just a joke long. If you were trying to figure out something to do with that, you fell for it, sucker. Uh, with the x's, we just say that, uh, let's say, plus mg sub x minus friction equals 0, or the fact that mg sub x equals f, and so friction must equal the lesser 34 newtons. Equilibrium is okay, but things get more exciting when there's acceleration and we're accelerating rockets into outer space. And that is going to depend on Newton's second law of motion, which is this here. Write this down if you don't have it written down already. Now all this is saying is this very, the same things we've seen before. Sum of all forces is not equal to zero anymore. They are out of balance and you're going to have mass times acceleration. Now, it's easiest to apply this just in one direction at a time when you're working with a set of axes. We'll do some problems on this next time. Stay tuned, my friends.